Hi, and welcome to the Special Situations cast. My name is Branda Haas. I run the Special Situations report, which you can find on Sigma Alpha. Um, before we jump into the interview with my guests of today, I want to make a few things clear. Uh, nothing on this uh, show is investment advice. Um, it's for entertainment purposes. Either me or my guest may have positions in any stocks or uh, securities that we discuss. So keep that in mind and please go and enjoy my uh, interview of today. Thank you. Hello. Welcome to another um, episode of the uh, Special Situations cast. We have a very special guest today, Perth Toll. And Perth was born in Beijing and moved to the United States at the age of nine. After college, she lived in Hong Kong for about a year and traveled around China. And she noticed a great disparity between what she'd seen as a child and her current situation. She worked at Fidelity as a um, vice president at Amplify ETFs and she's the founder of Life and Liberty Indexes and launched uh, the Freedom ETF, um, ticker is FRDM. Uh, welcome, Perth. Thank you for having me. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Cool. Yeah, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm good. I'm uh, getting used to this. Uh, it's, it's, it's lockdown again in uh, Europe, so oh, but this man. time I'm used to it. <laughs> Well, hopefully, I mean, it looks like we might have a vaccine here soon, so. I heard, yeah. Let's That's hope. Yeah. Great news, great yes. news. Uh, is it 2021 is going to be an entirely fresh start. New president, yeah. vaccine. Yes. I mean, <laughs> who doesn't love it? Um, yeah. Let's see. Um, the, the first thing I wanted to ask you is maybe... Um, what what drew you to investing or how did you uh, get into the industry or why you like it so much? That's three questions. But. Yeah, so I think the investment industry is a very um, interesting place to be because when you have, when you're in a place to direct assets, whether it be your own assets or the assets of other people that they've entrusted you with, um, that's a position of, of privilege and responsibility. And, um, and you're, you can either use that power for good or for evil. And so, especially in emerging markets, right, where there's, there's really no um, neutral, there you're either supporting, you know, freer markets or autocracies, um, to have that uh, ability to direct assets to where you think you can make the world a better place, whether it be funding capital markets or whether it be promoting, um, you know, freer societies, uh, that's something that, that we have the power to do. And so that's, that's uh, something that I love about the industry. Yeah, that's, uh, it's so cool that you, um, it just what, what drives you because it's also so, so difficult because you, on one hand, you're a fiduciary for people's uh, investment and you take care of the money. And at the same time, you're really trying to uh, make a difference with the Freedom ETF. We'll explain in, uh, uh, later in this interview what exactly it is, but it is, um, I think part of the movement to to have some impact as well with, with true investments and yeah. um yeah is it it's just a solution to you that you package them at, um, in one or um because often people see it as a balance of goals right, right. so sometimes people see uh, conflicting goals of you know making the world better or getting the highest returns um, mm -hmm. I do think that freedom is an area where, you know, obviously we made this for people who believe in the long-term benefits of freedom on markets um, and on society. But um, even even if that's not your, your belief, you know, freedom is, tends to be, um, you know, the freer countries tend to perform more sustainably, they tend to recover faster as we're seeing now, um, and they tend to use their capital and labor more efficiently. So there's a lot of... Um, I guess, uh, investment um, reasons to invest in the freer countries as well. Right. Okay. So I think I made a mistake because we really need to uh, explain to people uh, um, um, what exactly you designed or what your um, idea oh, is. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So to, to explain what we designed here, so we have a freedom-weighted emerging markets equity index. And so what we do is 
we take a freedom score that's given to us by our data providers who are the Cato Institute, the Fraser Institute, and the Friedrich Naumann Foundation out of Germany. And these guys have a joint project called the Human Freedom Index and Dataset. And what they do with that data set is they take um, 70, 76 different variables of personal and economic freedom. So you're looking at civil freedoms, political freedoms, and economic freedoms, or what I call the rights to life, liberty, and property. And there's 76 variables in here, such as number of press killings in a year, or number of you know, um, press like, killings is a uh, journalist murdered or yes. So that's a right uh, to life, right? And or it's, uh, disappearances, detain the, detainment, torture. Country like score that. higher than uh, single digits. Like, right yeah. Here. So, oh. so for example, they'll have an ordinal scale for that. So if just as an example, I don't know if this is the actual scale they use, but for example, a, a country that has more than 20 will get a score of zero. A country that has less than 20 but more than 15 will get a score of one, and so on and so forth. So this is how they quantify human freedoms. And the reason I, I know this system so well is in the beginning, when I first had this idea to do this index and this ETF, there was no way to quantify human freedoms, and we had to come up with our own. So we came up with our own human freedom kind of quantification method, we called it the HRQ, the human rights quotient. And, um, you know, we had a, a provisional patent on that. And when I went to score countries, when I actually left my job at Fidelity, which I loved, and um, started this company, and I went to score countries, which by the way, is a process that takes four to six months out of the year, if I were to do it myself. Um, but I had that system, and I, I was going to do it. So I, I went to score the countries, and I found at that time, which Fraser at the time was one of our data providers for he economic freedom. And so I went to their website to get the economic freedom data, and I saw that they had a new link called Human Freedom Index. And I was like, what is this? So I called my, my contact there, Fred, and you know, I was like, Fred, what is this? And, I, and we share, we compare notes because I had a system, they had a system, and it was almost identical. And I said, this is great. Can I just use yours? That saves me not only four to six months out of the year, but it gives me complete third party objectivity. So I don't sit here and pick and choose which countries I like better. It's all done by third party data providers. Okay, I'll uh, just, because you, you, you went over real quickly, but I'll summarize it and you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, you designed an ETF that invests in emerging markets and instead of the normal weighting, which is on GDP basis, I think. Market capitalization is the usual method. Oh, uh, right. But like countries aren't they? Like, oh, they're like the market cap of the entire country of the. Yeah. So the, the complete market cap of the, 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 all the market cap of all the companies within that country. Oh, that so it's not your part of world GDP that. that um... uh, no, most indexes are. But GDP does have to do with the classifications of, you know, emerging or developed, but the indexes themselves are typically based on um, the market, market capitalization cap. of all oh, the companies right. inside of it. So it's company level driving the country weights. Oh, I actually that's didn't, didn't know that. So <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's not ours. That's most of the others out there, right? So like exactly, MSCI, because you, uh, you have a novel system and, yeah. and the freer a country is on a lot of the metrics that you just, um, um, summarized yeah the more it's weighted in your index and it, I thought that was like a real cool system and um, <laughs> makes you. a lot of sense I was yeah super curious the, the, is this just, just your ideals or did you also backtest this or um, f find out that it works really well or um, yeah what really yeah so so we did back test it. We had a five year back test and it did do well in the back test. Now, back tests are not something that I'd like to count on as any kind of predictive measure. I mean, as you can see, we did the back test in 2017 when the index first went live. Um, of course, it, it did well, um, but it was, you know, it still was only a five year time frame and it was backward looking. It's not perfect. Um, and what we're seeing now in real time is a great test of the strategy. So, um, you know, if you look at history, freer markets typically have had more sustainable returns. So you see returns like in China, for example, those are returns driven by a lot of debt driven growth. 
um, and that's not as sustainable as a country that where the people power the growth, where you know human ingenuity is the the the, the, engine, the growth engine, right? So they usually have more uh, faster recoveries. So you can look at the drawdown since the bottom in March, and we have recovered faster than both the broad emerging markets like EEM, VWO, and IMG, and also um, the ex-China emerging markets, which we often get compared to because we have no China in the index. Um, so that's another reason why we freedom weight is that if you don't freedom weight and you have these market capitalization weighted indexes, you end up with 40 to 45% in China alone, which is a diversification risk or a concentration risk, I should say, and uh, it's not diversified. And you also have Saudi Arabia, Russia, Egypt, Turkey, some of these very unfree markets. And that's a problem in the emerging markets because a lot of emerging markets are still emerging out of their autocracies and so forth. So um, that's why we created the freedom weighted strategy so that we don't end up with any weights in these very unfree markets like China, Russia, Egypt, and Turkey. Yeah, and you, you do you do some uh, novel other things like you've excluded uh, state-owned enterprises. I think that yeah. also moves you a lot towards like uh, technology um, weightings. But um, just to go a little bit back to uh, a bit of a higher level, um, you just kind of said that you didn't really design it for uh, performance, right? right. So this is really driven by your ideals to offer this alternative to people you're not as invested in countries that restrict uh, people's freedom in three different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we are here to provide, I mean, we do expect performance in the long run because these are, the freer markets do historically perform much better in the, in the long run, but we don't promise that. That's, not why we created this. We created this for, for the people who do not want to direct their assets toward autocracies and support and give those types of governments more legitimacy and more immunity to commit their human rights atrocities. So, okay. well, you know, China being always exhibit A. I'm, I'm um, getting you know, the impression they, that you know more about this subject than you uh, you can uh, can uh, tell us about. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so I'll I'll, uh, I'll I'll give the rest, but okay. um, yeah, and I understand that you you set this up like completely by yourself. You built this uh, fund or this ETF. I'm sorry. I wouldn't take all the credit for it because oh. I I'm just fortunate to be in position to be able to start this company and to to be able to do the you know this strategy. I mean, it is something that I am proud of having done but I did not do it alone and ha never have I ever in the process been alone. Um, firstly, in the US, the ETF ecosystem is a very friendly and welcoming place. And they've always, the ETF people have always been the underdogs of the investment world. And uh, you know- You wouldn't say so, so these days. The yeah, that's true. It's, it's starting to turn around um, quite a bit, but still, you know, we get a lot of flack. And so we're used to kind of being the underdogs and we, Kind of well, we have more diversity and a more welcoming culture than I think some of these other traditional Wall Street types of industries. Um, so even when I was, you know, very young starting out, like uh, very green in this, there was a lot of support. A lot of people thought I was crazy, but there was also a lot of support. And people who even thought it was crazy still supported me and said, "Hey, it might be crazy, but you know, do it." And so um, I've always had a lot of support. And now I have this great partners in Alpha Architect, um, Wes Gray and his team, and, um, you know, true freedom believers and freedom fighters. And so um, they're a great partner to have. And what they do is they are the operations partners on the fund. So they run the fund and they trade the fund every day. So uh, that is a, a great, you know, partnership that I, I so appreciate. And, um, yeah, maybe for I the. I highly recommend those guys. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but for the novices um, like me, um, like uh, Alpha Architect is like a larger brand, and they have their own ETFs, but they also um, like power the back end of a number of independents, and you're one of those. Right. So that and we we hear in the states call it white labeling. So they they do have their own funds, and then they have white label funds like ours um, and, yeah 
all right, and then you uh, fall kind of under a larger compliance organization and um, yes. uh, like with a lot of the technology and that it trades well and all those things and exactly. you can take care of uh, designing ETFs and, and the, that sort of thing. Exactly. So they would be right. the, they're the fund issuers. We are the index providers. Okay. And you are responsible for the portfolio and there for a lot of the technical details. Right. So we, we are responsible for the index portfolio and they're responsible for tracking that index portfolio with the fund. Okay. Well, thank you. That helps. Um, and, uh, when did you start working on the launch? Because I think you're live for two or three years. Is that um, the fund has been live for one and a half years. So it, it launched in May of 2019, so last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, the index has been live for about three years. It, was, it started in 2017, so it's just over three years. Okay. Well, it's uh, a t tough, tough time. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, uh, Certainly. In the last nine years, you, you could have picked better. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> uh, ETF is doing great. I think you're uh, doing absolutely uh, fine. And uh, what were like some of the largest hurdles uh, to overcome and uh, before you got to launch it? Yeah. So I think the largest hurdle when you're starting an ETF is the first investor. You know, where do you get that first investor? Um, and so for us, uh, we, we were fortunate. Let me tell you the story of how we got our first investor. So uh, when I first started this company, um, I actually, when I, even when I, before I started this company, when I was working at Fidelity and I had this idea already, um, I wanted to do freedom waiting and, um, another company that was doing non cap waiting was research affiliates. And I was working in the Pasadena branch of Fidelity investments at the time when I first, you know, knew about, found out about research affiliates and research affiliates was down the street. So we are on South Lake Avenue. And I could walk to their office. And so I used they to- They are like by... a very famous quant firm, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So Research Affiliates is a fundamental indexing shop. They're famous for their RAFI indexes. And they have about, I believe, um, 150 billion in assets currently tracked, tracking their indexes. So they don't run any money themselves. They just provide indexes. So they're an index provider like I am. Um, so what they were doing that was different and novel was instead of market cap weighting, they were fundamental waiting. And so I w would, would, was such a fan of this because I was like, wow, somebody else is doing, you know, non-market cap waiting and they're great. So I would use, I used to stalk their office, like walk past their office, be like, wow, it's research affiliates in there. Um, so I was a huge fan. And when I left Fidelity, many years after that, I called them and I was like, hey, I have this idea for freedom waiting. Would you guys like to partner on this? And they were like, um, please go away. <laughs> they were not interested at all. I could not get past like the first person. Um, so I, you know, kept on going and, and started, you know, trying to find out as much as I could about the indexing business, about the ETFs. And I went to, um, this ETF.com conference, um, uh, inside ETFs, which is the biggest ETF conference in the world. There's about 2000 atten you know, attendees every year. Um, and at that conference, there was an in intra-conference app where you could tweet out kind of to the other conference attendees what's going on. And so somebody tweeted while they were in a China talk, they were like, I can't believe this guy is talking about China and he hasn't once mentioned the one child policy and its implications. Now the one child policy is the policy that I grew up under when I was in China. And it has had a huge and profound impact on me and my generation. It completely changed the culture of our generation. And um, I think it's gonna have even profounder impacts going forward. And that's something that is, Un, you know, okay. it's it's irreversible going uh, at this point. So yeah, I can think you that, explain. I mean, younger listeners may not have heard of it. Okay, maybe. so the one child policy for thirty years, from nineteen eighty to about two thousand ten, um, China only allowed you to have one child. If you got pregnant with a second one, you couldn't keep the child, basically, or you had to pay a fine that was like equivalent to your whole, you know, life savings. Um, so People um, had a lot of selective births, um, let's put it that way, and the, the male to female birth ratio became 118 to 100 um, in favor of boys. And normally it's about 105 max to 100. So 
that is a very skewed birth ratio. And there are now currently, by official China data estimates from the state, six, uh, 30 million missing women. And by other estimates, 60 million missing women in China as a result of the one child policy. The one child policy has now become the two child policy. So you now have two children. Um, but as freedom indexers, we don't believe that you should restrict the number of children anyone should have. So we, you know, we hope to see them open that up and not restrict the number of children you can have. Um, and I, I think that would be better for them in the long run, demogra demographic wise. And did that uh, yeah, solve that's like really this because it's kind of a tragedy that, um, yeah, well, I can think of some reasons how that skew um, came to be. And uh, is it now solved since there's a two child policy or? Yeah, now that there's a two child policy, it's not really solved because you can't make up for all those generations of missing people, right? Right. Uh, and also, like I said, our. But they're not disappearing oh. at the same rate anymore. I, I'm not talking, trying to, um, you know. Mm. Um, I'm sure that is improved. I would hope the, right. the you know disappearing women, but um, a lot of people are not having two children, even though it's allowed, because okay. of the rising costs of childcare in China, of all kinds of other social issues, and also because it changed the values of our generation and family or having a lot of children is no longer a common value for my generation in China. So that's. One so, of the main, yeah, that's one of the biggest issues that not only close to my heart, but that inspired me to start this. And, and it's an issue that's, that's, you know, I think had a profound impact and still continues to have, have an impact on China and its demographics. And China now, as a result, has the worst demographics in the world. Uh, and that's just not good for its long-term outlook. Um, so, so that the, so the person tweeted that out in the conference to go back to oh, the I'm conference sorry. story. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. Uh, and so, so he tweeted that and I was like, wow, somebody else here knows and cares about the one child policy. So I meet with him and he ends up being the um, president of a very small CFA society in Tennessee. And he asked me to go and speak there. So I did. And then they recommended me for a CFA society um, dinner in Tampa, Florida. And this was my first year doing this. I had no idea what was going on. Uh, but I was on this panel with BlackRock, Morningstar, myself, and a guy named David Kotak. After the panel, David Kotak invites me to a fishing camp. And I was like, what? <laughs> I've never gone fishing in my entire life. Um, and this is a camp of 50 economists and financial people who, you know, go fishing in the woods in Maine, like literally almost in Canada, for four days with no Wi-Fi. And I think they have Wi-Fi now. This was 2016 where they didn't have Wi-Fi. Um, so I was like, who does this? And then, but my friends are like, oh, you know, you should go because, you know, it's really fun. You can meet cool people. Barry Ritholtz is going and all this. Barry goes every year. Um, and so I went and um, last minute I decided to get a seaplane to get into camp because you can either drive or get a seaplane. And so I called the seaplane company. I was like, hey, I'm coming in. I was coming in from, New I was like, I'm coming in from LaGuardia today. Can I get a seaplane? Is it too late? And they were like, no, you can share with Rob Arnott. He doesn't have anyone to share the seaplane with. Rob Arnott is the chairman of Research Affiliates, the company that I was stalking. Um, and unsuccessfully. And he is a very famous researcher and I think uh, maybe billionaire or at least very rich person. Yes. <laughs> so um, so I, I shared, the, so there's like just, they, they're literally like, yeah, just intercept him at the airport. Here's his flight number, American Airlines, blah, blah, blah. And so I just intercepted him at the airport. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> did they tell you we were going to be writing together? And he was like, yes. And so that's how we meet. He is a very, you know, vocal libertarian. And he loves, you know, freedom for markets, for people. He just, he's very passionate about it. He hears about this idea and he loved it. And he ends up being our first investor um, in the oh, fund. Now, he, doesn't, he doesn't go to this camp every year. Oh, so there he's is never a little, gone back little, since. Little, Oh, <laughs> he was only there that year because he lost a bet to Barry Ritholtz and he had to pay it back. He was there to pay a bet only. And so this is not something that I could have orchestrated. I tried unsuccessfully. Um, that's why when I, when you say you did this fund all on your own, no, I, you know, there are many no. bigger forces at work here. <laughs> so no, but I mean, it's a super cool story and uh, <laughs> yeah, Thank but, you. but I think you, you would have found someone else it's a great concept i think uh oh, thank you. but uh you're blessed with uh, uh robert not on board because he's uh quite Absolutely. famous and um 
tools. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, because so there's a little bit of a libertarian root, root here because I was, uh, I almost called you like the Ayn Rand of ETFs in the oh. introduction, but <laughs> no, uh, no, no. <laughs> So, I have dis I have disagreements with Ayn Rand, but we okay. won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, yeah. Just to I was I kind of uh, liked your or, or I was really curious about your what you told me about China and um, the one child policy. So because it's almost unimaginable for me that the state tells me how many children I can have, even though it's just like 50, 60 years ago that like. Uh, my government in the Netherlands, they told people um, that you had to have other people live in your house. If you had like a large house and it was like a housing shortage. Oh, they, I see. You, you know, and I mean, it's not the same thing, but um, yeah, it's just 50, 60 years ago. And uh, things can change so much, but still, so this had a, huge impact on you and, and your parents and yep. also on people you know in China and you think yep. it really changed the culture that people are now much more individualistic or no I think they're more paternalistic toward the government um, where they oh. let the government make some of these decisions for them um, yeah and they know, like that was... say it again and, and they like that the government makes those decisions for? Um, well, I don't know. If they don't like it, they can't say it. So we don't know. Oh, right. <laughs> you get disappeared if you say something. Um, so you have to like it, I guess. Um, and I think with so much economic growth there in the past 30 years or so, uh, most people are happy to just uh, make money. Sure, um, yeah. I think that's a point, global yeah, phenomenon. But, yeah, but you, you still notice the, um, nobody sends their children to school in China. They always send their children to freer, freer countries, right? U US, UK, Canada, Australia. Um, uh, if you they, can afford it, you do the right. exchange. Everybody who can't afford to get out, gets out. So, I mean, I think that says something. There's a lot of capital flight out of the country, more than from any other country in the world, um, from China. And um, that's, you know, they, they have to put a lot of capital controls in place to even keep some of the money in the country. So, um, you know, like I have friends who have, can, you know, go to China to take $50,000 out at a time because they can't take more than that out at a time. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of controls that have to be in, in place when you don't let people just freely move about, move about. Yeah. That's something else that if you don't know about it, you can just wire money, uh, yeah. to other countries or buy anything you want in another country. Um, like the money can come in, but yeah. it can't leave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think if it comes in, it depends a little bit uh, whose money it is. Nowadays, it's, <laughs> it's becoming easier. But uh, and then people do things like buy super expensive watches in Hong Kong or gold right. or uh, Bitcoin. Uh, had a huge uh, run there. Uh, so yeah, that's super interesting. But also, uh, yeah, very, very hard to understand um it's hard to imagine from from us who've grown up mostly in free world you know in the free mar uh, markets and in free countries yeah it's absolutely yeah. yeah yeah i think the pandemic is like a great um, that gives a little bit of insight in uh how yeah. that works because how effective some of the asian countries were uh, mm -hmm. like in a perverse way it can be a, an advantage and how uh, disorganized uh, some of our societies are. Uh, it's also a strength, but it's also, yeah, sometimes it works against you. Well, you know, that's a, that's a good point because Taiwan, for example, had the best pandemic success in the world, I would say. South Korea, also very successful, though not in the beginning. I think uh, those are like the two largest weddings in, the, yeah. in, your, Surprisingly, in your ETF. Yeah, and, and when when the drawdown happened, they fell more than China because China actually put a um, restriction on selling. I know, selling. I know, because I shorted a lot of things and it didn't work at <laughs> all. Like <that> didn't, yeah. <laughs> so, so you know that you could call it market manipulation or whatever you want to call that, uh, but that's not a real market where you have price discovery. 
So no, uh, I shorted an airline, a Chinese airline, and just completely shut down, and it didn't go down. <laughs> yeah, the the airline completely shut down. No, yeah, I think it wasn't moving anyone because you know <laughs> they, they they did a pretty good jo job of the shutdown, but the stocks wow. just went up. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I think that's a great example. Uh, what airline was it? Yeah, I think I did a few, but uh, maybe Cathay okay. Pacific was one of them. Um, yeah, send those to me. I, I want to look at more into that. That's really interesting. Okay. Um, but yeah, no, that that uh, is a great example of, you know, this is not a market you should treat like any other market where information is transparent and reliable and free to be, you know, traded on. Um, it's it and we we here in the west can't imagine that so we treat it like every other market but it's not uh but if you look at taiwan and south korea and their response yeah. to the coronavirus there was a lot of transparency there's a lot of fast action there was no repression on information like you saw out of china um and so as a result their market went down more in the in the downturn but they've also recovered faster um so you see that a lot in the freer markets is that there's they let their markets trade on the information in a transparent way. Um, so what markets do that? Because, oh, I'm so, so sorry to no, interrupt. Fine. No, it's just uh, <laughs> uh, I, um, it's, it's a bit, a bit, a bit of a pet peeve, but uh, the, like it's so weird how the U.S. trades or Europe in this pandemic, and mm. yeah, it's just really strange to me. So, but I get your point. It is a much more natural market. I, yeah. I should have let you yeah. just finish your point. Yeah. I mean, Taiwan also, you know, SARS came out of China, avian flu came out of China. So Taiwan was very familiar with these types of infectious diseases when they come out of China and being so close and so interconnected with them. They knew exactly what to do. In January, they were already taking measures and no nobody else in the world had even heard about it yet um china was telling the the who at the time that it, there was no human to human transmission and despite that taiwan did the exact opposite of what china said and they knew exactly what to do so even though but they weren't even a part of the who because of politics from china so um so so yeah i think uh taiwan handled this extremely well and now is a model for the world so i think they they've had a great year yeah, yeah, I uh, agree. There was a, f a fun video clip about uh, WHO call with uh, about Taiwan. I think you can find it on YouTube. Um, but they, they sort of have an antagonistic relationship with China. There's a lot of um, um, hostility between them. Are you worried about that or not really? So Taiwan has had the cannons pointed at them from China every day. Um, and it's not anything new. So if we worry about that, then we have to worry about the rest of the world too, because China has an antagonistic relationship with just about everyone. <laughs> so, and yeah, they started with Taiwan because it's closer and they consider it like a, their own, like just like they consider women's reproductive rights their own, you know, so they consider everything their own, especially Taiwan. So, <laughs> so um, I think that if we worried about China invasion or, you know, China uh, and don't invest in Taiwan as a result, that would hurt Taiwan and help China. It would be like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I absolutely right. do not um, want to. Yeah. So I, yeah, I try okay. to, yeah, support makes, Taiwan in my investments. That makes sense. And then um, because you um, uh, went a little bit into detail in um, how strange uh, China's capital markets are, um, but I'm, you know, you know a lot more about this than I do, obviously. And they have this weird structures with VIEs or something. And it's, I mean, you you don't have to explain how it all works, but it's like, it's it's not it's not like you really own the country or I really own the companies you invest in. It's some sometimes it's a really complicated structure that that goes through like. Um, some of these tax havens, I, I can't think of yeah. them right now, but um, yeah, do you, can you give us some color on that or what do you think about that? Or? Yeah, I'm not an expert on that. So okay. I'm, I'm not gonna 
go into that very deeply, but sure, there are sure. a lot of obscure structures when you invest in Chinese companies, even the big ones. So if you're an investor in um, and financial, well, and financial, you can't really be an investor now because that all went away um, in a in spectacular a fashion. fashion. But um, let's say you wanted to invest in Ant. Ant is not just a fintech company that you're investing in, but it also invests in other companies um, like a biometric company, and uh, you know that is tied in with the de China defense and military. So there are a, a lot of obscure structures in these companies and it is by law state secret and they cannot share those structures and they cannot share audits with the world. So, you know, as, as you know, the listings in U.S. have started to crack down on this and start to, to scrutinize this more carefully, whereas before we allowed China that loophole of listing in the U.S. without meeting our audit requirements. And now we are looking at that like, why didn't we, why, why shouldn't they have to meet audit requirements like everyone else? Well. In the meantime, their law in China says they are not allowed to open their audit books. So the, the two are in direct conflict and, um, and something that, that American investors, I think, are, and, and global investors are becoming more aware of now. Yeah, there's been like a whole, um, just like a movie to China hustle about this uh, concept because it already happened another time, like 15 years. No, I I haven't seen that movie. Everybody has mentioned it to me, and I know you oh. know Mark Cuban, you know, had a part in it or whatever. But I, I need to see that. <laughs> I still haven't seen it. Yeah, I think you you really need to see it. I, I yeah, mean, it's not, not that everybody needs to see it, but uh, <laughs> it's 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 fun. It's not a, like okay. a Hollywood thing, but it's uh, it's a great movie. I re absolutely recommend everybody thank who likes it. No, it's on my list. I need to see it. Yeah. <laughs> um so so thank you that's 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 great and then um you excluded like wait i'm going to ask you first so you you don't really like china at this point and it's improved a lot of um, metrics that you track um so do you have like a zero percent weighting or is china like a small weighting because if countries yeah. don't score so well on freedom then they get a small weighting right so um, yeah. maybe, you know, Brazil so, has a small weighting or so so yeah so how the methodology works is that the freer countries get a higher weight the less free countries get a lower weight and the worst offenders as far as personal and economic freedoms the combination of the two are excluded altogether and China is one of those it's excluded altogether so we have zero allocation and is it then like the, the lowest scoring 25% or how? Uh... We don't draw a line in the sand. Oh. The methodology is a relative weighting methodology. So it, it looks at the relative score uh, among its, its colleagues, among its yeah. peers. So we're looking at its relative score um, among all the emerging markets. And so, right. So if all the emerging markets become like havens of uh, freedom, then... Uh, like really advanced free countries will still get excluded because they're the just yeah if all the emerging markets become havens of freedom yeah. they would all probably by then be developed markets that is exactly how developed markets are so that's why there is no value add for a strategy like this in developed markets that I can see as well, you know definitely not uh, as much as emerging markets so if, if that happens we would just be any other emerging markets fund so yeah. we hope but the yeah, ETF would have also been like wildly successful, uh, I think. Right. <laughs> I think that we're a long way from that. But And so right now, a strategy like this is still sorely needed, in my opinion. And that's why yeah. we're here. Uh, but we hope for that scenario. I hope that China comes into this index one day. Yeah. And I yeah. look forward to that day. I love China. I love its people. I just don't like the governance structure. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, I think I love that about your ETF that you really root for countries to uh, improve on those metrics and Absolutely. get in there. Yeah, and, um, and to give you an idea, you know, China has a they my think tanks they score the think tank partners they score 162 countries, and China has a ranking of 126 out of 162. To okay. you know contrast that, let's look at Taiwan. So Taiwan has a ranking of 19 out of 162. So you're looking at Taiwan 19, China 126. So there's a huge oh. difference there. 
Yeah. Um, China is yeah. Lower, right now even lower than Russia. Like Asia is, I think, uh, very, um, um, the, I think the worst disparate in that because like Singapore probably scores pretty well, Yeah, I think. And uh, like South Korea is, of course, great, but maybe that's not an emerging market. Yeah, Singapore is not an emerging market. South Korea, oh. we do consider emerging. Oh, South yeah. Korea, you do. Okay. Yeah. And um, yeah, maybe the rest, I, I don't, I'm not so sure. Um, and then you excluded the state owned enterprises. That's a little bit of, um, um, I think, Asian, Russian, and in Europe, you see it a little bit like that. Uh, yeah, it depends on the country. So, you know, in Poland, for example, there are a lot of state owned banks. Um, we, we take the top 10 largest, most liquid companies in each country. And yeah. so in Poland, if we take the top 10 largest, most liquid without the ex state owned, then we would have like seven state banks in there. So okay. by, by having the ex state owned rule on top of that, we exclude those state banks and we include other, you know, companies that are private, um, privately held and, and more or, you know, publicly traded, but not owned by the state. And, um, and we believe those are, are more efficient um, companies. Um, state-owned enterprises have to answer to two masters. They have to answer to shareholders and the state. And the state typically wins in that case. I mean, in China, you see these state-owned banks, they don't have to pay back their loans. You know, th these types of things happen. It's just inefficient. Um, and right, so like in the States, it's uh, shareholder value, shareholder value, shareholder value. Mm -hmm. And then um, in um, maybe a state owned enterprise in um, Greece or something, and it's a little bit, yeah, but we need to do something for a community. And um, uh, the boss says so, so let's do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so I could see that that would like leak some value away. So that uh, sounds like a great idea to exclude those. And are they like already like super undervalued, those state enterprises? Do, does the market adjust for it, or do you? Or you have no idea? Um, I don't know. I think it depends on, depends on the case per case. Um, in, you know, and, and we exclude the state-owned enterprises. Um, another reason why is because we want to bring that economic freedom theme all the way through. And we believe, you know, the less government interference in mm -hmm. private markets, the better. So yeah. that's another reason why we do it. Yeah. And I think, uh, you, I think it, it works great if they stop being state owned enterprises and then they get into your, uh, <laughs> in your fund. Right. So I think, yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. And then you, you, you don't have a lot of exposure to resource companies. That's something that uh, stood out to me because usually emerging markets is, uh, is a lot of resources. It can be like oil wow. and Saudi Arabia or uh, Brazil is a lot of iron ore. And, uh, um, so okay. how did you, um, fate those so again that's basically just freedom waiting and the freer countries tend to not be as dependent on a single natural resource so countries you think of like you mentioned brazil saudi arabia and russia yeah. are very um dependent on one single natural resource whereas freer markets tend to be more dynamic and they tend to innovate better and so they tend to be more flexible to, to market trends. So for example, in Chile, there's a company called SQM, which is a mining company. And they, they used to, their main mining um, used to be on copper. Yeah, it's probably copper. And then China had their, you know, state subsidies for electric vehicle companies. And there was this huge demand out of China um, for lithium batteries. So they, they pivoted from mining copper to mining lithium at a time when copper wasn't doing so well and lithium was. So companies in freer markets can make these adjustments faster and innovate better than and be more responsive to market trends, even if it's a market trend in an unfree market that they trade with. So we don't penalize trade. We actually, the, the more trade, the better. We actually give a higher score for freer trade. And so we have a lot of countries like Taiwan, like Chile, that trade with China, and we don't penalize them for that. They're allowed to benefit from market activity from unfree markets and bring that um, benefit to the freer markets. Yeah, and I think uh, Chile ran like great economic policies for a while, and they really had 
terrific growth and they became like the envy of South America for, uh, for a while. Um, I think they have some problems in the last few years, but uh, yeah, that's an uh, amazing country. And um, it's, it was, so you have like 26% Taiwan uh, in Chile is like 14%. Um, so I was, is Taiwan and just scoring so much higher or how does the, uh, yeah, so so the way our our scoring works, it actually or the methodology works. It takes the scores and it kind of cascades the the country weights. So you get always like four in the top four. The top four are always the biggest kind of weights, and then the middle four are kind of the the middle weights, and then the bottom two are two to four. It, we're not limiting the number of countries. It's always been ten countries. Um, and 10 stocks per country. So that's why we call it the Freedom 100, but it's not limited oh, to 10 okay. countries. It could be 11, it could be nine, it could be 12. So typically the, the top four are the biggest, the next four are the middle. So the biggest ones right now are Taiwan, South Korea, Chile, and Poland. Um, so, so yeah, that's how it worked out. But to give you an idea of their scores and how much better they, you know, they are, but uh, you know, for example, Chile is a 28 out of 162, that's their rank. Right, so as you recall, um, Taiwan was 19. South Korea mm -hmm. is 27. And Poland, which has its own problems, but again, this is a relative weight, Poland is 40. So the laggard of the big group. Um, so, and, you, know, uh, you know, they I mean, do you're... have oh. quite a difference in their kind of scoring. Okay. And um, I was I was curious. So, what do you see like as um, Poland's uh, primary problems? Or uh... yeah, so Poland actually has seen their score decline in the past five years. Yeah. Um, as you know, they elected kind of a very, very kind of almost extremist right wing kind of um, government. Um, and yeah, there's a little bit of a wave of that in uh, Europe. Yeah. And there used to be in the U.S. and hopefully, you know, we see the tide changing here. Um, so their main problem, what the, what, where they've seen a lot of declines is um, rule of law, legal system and property rights, um, which includes judicial independence. Judicial independence has been a major issue in Poland. Um, okay. So so that's is something that's comparable that to Hungary, which is maybe a little it bit. It is comparable to Hungary, though not okay. quite as bad. Yeah. Okay. Because I was thinking that's maybe an example for a lot of people. It uh, uh, has already got a lot of press in the Economist. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. All right. So that's uh, so it's declining, but it's, it's as declining. kind of a cool tech sector, right? Because we saw like there's yes. one really hot company in your uh, uh, ETF, which is like a gaming company out of Poland. DD Project. Yeah, and there, I think the stock is pretty, uh, you know, went ballistic, but maybe it's it pulled is back ballistic a little bit. Ballistic is a good word for it, yes. <laughs> maybe it pulled back some today because today there was like a big um, yeah. vaccine. Well, I think uh, by the time the vaccine rotation. news came out in the US, I think the Polish market was already closed, right? Okay. So I don't think it's going to reflect today, but maybe tomorrow. Okay, <laughs> well, watch if you have it in your portfolio, there's some bad news for you. But yeah. Um, yeah, but this is a really cool game designer and they're going to launch like a new title or something. And yeah. I think it's something like Grand Theft Auto. I'm actually not a... It's supposed to be as big, yeah. People are very, very excited about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. My yeah, friend so... Will, who runs a esports, uh, the nerd ETF, he, he and I talk about this company because it's a common holding in both. But yeah, it's according to him, people are very excited about it. He's an actual gamer, so... Okay. I listen to him when, when it comes to this particular company. <laughs> cool. Yeah. It's, uh... now, again, I don't choose the companies that are in here. It's the, the rule book chooses it. So uh, this particular company, though, CD Projekt, um, has really, as you said, just been red hot ballistic. And it's, it's, it makes like Amazon look like a treasury. So if you look at the you know, last <laughs> recent history. So it yeah. is one of those things where, you know, in this uh, in indexing, you know, you never know when you're going to catch the zeitgeist of the day. And one of those has been this company and the other one has been the semiconductor companies that we have. Yeah. Yeah. You, because you have uh, Taiwan and um, they, they have now, is 
is it the largest semiconductor company in the world or am uh, I exaggerating? It's definitely the largest in the index, the Taiwan okay. Semiconductor. Yeah. Um, and then we also have Samsung. And we Samsung. also have um, Honghai and MediaTek. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, that's, that, I think they're, they're doing amazing. I think especially. Uh, it is. They actually, Taiwan Semiconductor, because of them, you know, they, they hit a record high this year, which brought the TIEX, the Taiwan Stock Exchange, to uh, their index to a, to a 19 year record high. So it's, it's been great for them. Yeah, I think emerging markets in general have had like a good run now, right? Since uh, maybe a, the recovery from the. Uh, they got they, hurt pretty they bad in, the, in March. To, yeah, to, to, to ride this recovery because emerging markets are the, the world's kind of factories or you know chip producers in this case and so as the the world recovers from covid they're going to be i think a main beneficiary yeah and if trade has moved away from china that's maybe helped some of uh, yes the decoupling countries. which i think will stay in place regardless of you know what happens in the political environments of other countries because it's it's driven by china right it's initiated by china they're the, the aggressors in this so and it's, it's part of their long-term plan to decouple from the world. So it's not driven by any of these other countries, um, it, their actions. So it, that is a trend that, you know, looks like will continue. Yeah, so, so under uh, President Trump, relationships with China really deteriorated. And then now Biden is probably coming in and um, he may be, you know, restoring some of the relationships. Uh, but yeah, you still think does. that a uh, lot of trade gets moved away because people didn't really notice how vulnerable they were. Like, I, I mean, there was so much yeah. whining about supply chains. I was sometimes like, oh, come on. Um, uh, yeah, I thought it was sometimes a little bit overdone how much people talked mm. about it. But I get, I get it. And I think people will still remember that. Like, Yeah, no, I think Trump did overdo the, the anti-China rhetoric. And I think it became right. almost like a personal for him. And um, I don't think that's good at all for the, for the cause. Um, I think it's, we're not supposed to be, we're not here to be anti-China. We're here to be pro-freedom. So if, if China, you know, we want to help them become more free. And obviously engagement didn't work. Um, and if they're going to be the aggressors, we do need to stand up for the freer countries like Taiwan. Um, and I hope that we will. And we, I hope we stand up for Hong Kong and for the people of Xinjiang as well. Um, I don't think that's going to change with this administration because I think this administration, I get the vibe that they care about human rights. Now, that's not a vibe that I got from the Trump administration as much as they talked the anti-China rhetoric. I don't feel like human rights was the driving force behind it. Uh, with this administration, though, you know, Kamala yeah. Harris has come out and very clearly said we stand for Hong Kong. Um, you know, those those are public statements that it's in her tweets and everything. And so um, I don't know Biden's history, but I do I do think that he will typically do what the people want. And uh, hopefully and, you know, if this administration truly cares about human rights and they can lead with that it, when dealing with China, um, I think that would be great for the people of China and the people of America and around the world. Cool. Um, I'll, I'll just play a little bit of devil's uh, advocate because uh, somebody has to. Um, <laughs> so I think you're exactly right. Like um, the Trump administration, they wanted to end like they, what they figured was IP theft. And it was like mostly an economic agenda. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's been like this human rights agenda for a long time, also from Europe in the, the, with the China relationship. But it's not, well, it, it's, I think it's much more um, under the, so it's not so as visible. So, so yeah, I, I don't know. I not as visible in Europe? Yeah, like maybe i think like my prime minister you know there, there's like 15 million people living in my country it's like uh it's not even as much as in beijing and uh i think china doesn't care with the things but maybe you know you can still say something 
uh, for this is not cool what you're doing or uh, they have like a trade delegation and I think there's still you know pressure and dialogue but it's not really visible to me and it won't result in action like yeah. I'm not sure that like Biden administration will like put real action like it's not going to be like with Iran mm. I'm, that's my that's possible and, okay. and you know, have governments, or... yeah governments are notorious for talk and no action right and that's why we are here with the private market solution we don't want to count on the government to handle this situation we want to direct our investments to mm -hmm. the freer markets and support those markets and not the autocracies and so right. that's why we're here with the private market solution because yeah you're right governments are notorious for letting us down and we can't count on them to stand up for human rights and for personal and economic freedoms the way that we can ourselves yeah i think that's uh really cool about your uh etf and so there's no iran as well right and no um right. well, that's not that's not in the emerging markets universe right? oh okay yes yeah. so it's, it's not uh, in the others either is it a, like a frontier market yeah i guess it would have to be okay and yeah. then um, uh, yeah I noticed like one African country, South Africa. Yep. Um, so they're doing pretty well? Better than before. Yes, they have their own problems as well, as you know. Um, that is the only African country in our... No, I'm a value market. investor, so I've never invested in anything that doesn't have problems. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. So, so yeah, I mean, then you should be an emerging markets investor as well. <laughs> so. Yeah. There's no country without problems. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, yeah. And I, can again, double I, problems. Yeah. So I always look at the scores and South Africa yeah. in the past five years have improved their ranking by quite a bit. And, uh, cool. Yeah. So they went from being like in the high eighties, almost 90 rank to now 64 out of 162 in the past five years. So they wow. have, done well and they they do have higher scores on personal they're, freedom they're not above average right it's just yeah it's above average yeah it's, every country that's in our index is going to be above average yeah but that's for like um african gdp is still you know lagging behind a lot of other continents so that's pretty impressive maybe south africa is one of the more ri richer countries i think but, yeah, uh, it's more developed. Yeah, but like each, so Egypt scored pretty bad because Ooh, of, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Egypt, let's see. Because it's also a little bit more developed nation, uh, or I think in GDP terms. Yeah, still better than China. It's 157. Oh, okay. Wait, is that better than China? Hold on, it might be no, worse. No, maybe in just No, worse. that's worse than China. Yeah. China's 126, so it's worse, oh, okay. much worse. Um, yeah. 157 out of 162, almost bottom. 162 wow, okay. is Syria. 161 is Venezuela, and you go up and a little bit, and you get to Egypt. So oh. it's very bad, very bad. <laughs> oh. so, yeah, I, th I think maybe there's... Uh, I knew that there was a little bit of limited press freedom and uh, things like that, but I didn't know it was... So... Press freedom, laws that reg and regulations that influence media, they got a score of 1.3 out of 10, 10 being the highest score. Political okay. pressure and control on the media, they got a score of 1.5 out of 10. It's pretty bad. Um, they also have very poor scores on women's security and safety. So our data providers are one of the few that include homicides, disappearances, uh, terrorism, and women's safety and security because they believe that if you can't walk down the street without being shot at, then you're not really free. Or if you, know, you can't walk down the street without being killed, then you're not really free. So uh, these guys, uh, women, uh, sorry, women in Egypt, you know, looks like their safety and security score is less than one out of 10. So that's pretty poor. Okay, but so that's pretty cool. So even if there's like, like kind of an anarchy, which has like very few constraints on your freedom, uh but then indirectly there's like a lot of constraint in your freedom because it's like rule of the strongest yeah and then you still don't get into the index that's that's Correct. That's, that's nifty or uh, i'm telling you these guys oh. are the best i mean these are these are the world leaders in 
um, freedom in econometrics. So no, but it's a cool ETF design too. I uh, I really like it. Um, let's and um, okay, I'm going to move on a little bit because I don't want to uh, <laughs> keep you too long because you probably have You're a fine. lot of things to do. Uh, what's holding Brazil back? Because that's uh, that's a um, huge con. Oh. Homicide. It has the highest homicide rate in the world. Oh. So let me give you their score. So their homicides zero out of one, zero out of ten. <laughs> oh, okay. So that's exactly what we're talking about. Brazil is it, is it, is it drug it's related or what's what's driving that or you don't know? Their gang violence, their drug cartels. I don't know. It's 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 very high homicide rate. Uh, right. Zero out of ten. Worst. In the world and they've been declining uh, they've been declining year. so so they used to be their rank used to be uh looks like 70 ish and now they're 109 so in the past five years they've gone yeah they, they've implemented some bad economic and policy what i find interesting is i get a lot of so i meet a lot of people from these various markets because you know i live in america and we're very you know diverse um so you know there was a time when we just launched the fund and I was in New York for the fund launch, you know, activities. Uh, and in a subway, I met with these girls from Brazil and they, you know, we, we were talking about, you know, why I was here for this fund. And, and they were like, Hey, is Brazil in your index? And I was like, no, you know, it's not. And they were like, yeah, that sounds about right. So Brazilians <laughs> tend to agree with me that it shouldn't be in the index. And I get a completely opposite reaction from, um, Chinese people that I meet were, were, you know, well, there's, it's polarized. I guess some that are like, yeah, definitely shouldn't be in there. And then some that are like, oh, you suck that, you know, you, you know, betrayed the country and all this. So, <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, no, there, there's definitely a, a huge discrepancy between the way people respond in these markets. Like, and I see yeah. kind of a, a, like a freedom legacy there, because if you had the freedom to criticize your government, then you tend to be more vocal about it. And if you don't, then you don't so um and you see that in the the unrest that goes on around the world in free versus unfree markets and the response to it as well so you saw a lot of unrest in hong kong and you yeah. see that china clamped down on that and doubled down and now they have the national security law in place and it's 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 worse than it's ever been um and you saw a lot of unrest last year in chile at the same time as hong kong and chile has now uh voted to change their constitution so there's been a lot of, and there's a lot of unrest in the United States as well yeah. this year and last year. And, you know, we've made changes in our democratic process to correct some of those wrongs and address some of those things. And so you see this huge difference in the way free and unfree markets respond to unrest and to, you know, um, to the will of the people. And that's re re reflected in these scores, which, which include freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of the media, freedom of the media being very important uh, because you see in these freer markets, if you have freedom of the media, yeah, there can be bad media, there can be fake news, there can be lying media even, but the good media can overcome that. They can call out the bad media. There's a balance of powers and that media is a balance for the government's powers. So that is very important to have this, checks and balances in place right yeah uh absolutely i think that's like the big difference between that you were talking to somebody from brazil uh yeah. who's not controlled in that way uh, yeah. they don't get misinformation about how the government is run but uh yeah they're constricted in freedom in a different way uh but it's it's really evil how that works if your if your thoughts are uh controlled or what you are allowed to know that's it's hard to make the right decisions or change something for the better. Yeah. Um, and um, something else. So, so if a country does something like really egregious suddenly, like I think Syria did that with like the gas attacks. Um, can you then, yeah, I, I think Syria won the your index, but if uh, let's say, um, Taiwan yeah. or something like that. Can you just throw it out like that day or? We have a rule in the rule book, not that day, not, not gonna happen the same day, but there's a rule in the rule book that says if a country that is currently included in the index 
falls more than five points on a certain scale, then it does get kicked out. So it's a freedom decline momentum rule. And Turkey triggered that rule in January of 2018. It happens at the time of rebalance. So rebalance for us is in January. And they fell more than five points on this particular scale, scale that we use um, from a third party. And uh, it, it uh, got kicked out of the index because of their freedom momentum decline um, in 2017. Cool. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's nice. Yeah, um, yeah because the, the declines in momentum tend to, to go faster than increases in freedom momentum. So oh, it's just, 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 really just like careful. price declines. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then um, Russia, we didn't really talk about Russia yet. Okay. Uh, why is Russia not in there? Okay, so let's look at Russia's score. It's yeah. a, bit, a little bit like uh, Santa Claus book with the, the judgment, like that's yeah. That's <laughs> Again, these yeah. are my data providers, third party research. I don't pick and choose. We just look at the score here. Russia has a score of yeah. 114 out of 162. So just slightly better than China. Yeah. Um, and their main problem, um, obviously they have very bad freedom of expression and information, you know, poisoning, people who speak out isn't good. Um, like if somebody runs against you, you poison that, that's, that's, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, jailing dissidents and so forth. Um, their legal system and property rights are 4.8 out of 10. So that's, that's a problem on the economic freedom, but mostly it's their wow. personal freedoms that are getting them. Their rule of law, procedural justice, civil justice, criminal justice, you can imagine are used for political purposes. So um, their procedural justice gets a score of 2.9 out of 10, civil justice 5.3 out of 10, criminal justice 3.3 .3 out of 10 for a total of 4.0 out of 10. So not fantastic. Um, they have yeah. their freedom of domestic movement, and it's also a zero out of 10. Um, political pressure that control media, it's pretty poor. They do have very free, um, identity and relationships. So they don't kill people for being gay, for example. That's good. Um, yeah. That's, that's good. <laughs> no, but, but yeah. Uh, they yeah. very poorly on some of these. Methods. Yeah, Russia is like a super interesting example of uh, like a, how freedom, having no freedom doesn't really help your development of your country. Because yeah. yeah, they had communism for a long time, and they still kind of have something like that. And um, but it's a beautiful country, and there's super smart people, um, the yeah. best chess players in the world. Uh, or yeah, or, do you know Gary Kasparov? Great, yeah, okay. And uh, but they have You're like fan? a huge chess tradition. If great, are you a chess person? Well, I used to play it when I was a kid. I was a oh yeah, my did, gosh. Are you familiar with Gary Kasparov? Yeah, yeah, he's super okay. famous. He was, yeah. yeah, and he's also so, like, in, yeah, nowadays he's like an anti-Russia activist, right? Yeah, he's he's the chairman of the Human Rights Foundation, who I um, am a huge fan of and, and support. Um, and I met him personally through through them, and he's what it, he's awesome. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. He was like the LeBron James of just for a while. Yeah. You know, it's all uh, <laughs> you can't stay that for a long time because you, you get amazing. too old. Yes, I've had the pleasure to yeah. meet him. Oh wow! At okay, dinner and his wife and um, with other human rights foundation people. He's great. Well, I've, and how did? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if I can ask this, but how did you meet him, or how did it come about? Or it was the Human Rights Foundation. So I, oh, okay. you know, I'm a supporter of the Human Rights Foundation. They actually um, reached out to me. I was a huge fan of theirs, and and I was like, I can't believe these guys reached out to me to say, hey, you know, we kind of have the same mission so you know yeah yeah we come okay. alongside and so um so he's really like, criticizing putin and um trying to yeah he's been change. very vocal yeah yeah i think you, know, you can't um, live in russia anymore I, no definitely not <laughs> do you know bill I mean, even though he's like a hero you know to uh, because usually those are harder to touch mm. um so he, he's harder to touch because he was a hero to so many yeah you can kill heroes or the people or yeah it's harder but what about 
What about the uh, the guy that just got poisoned who was? The surgeon, I don't know. No, that's from the Bill Bruce. Um, uh, the guy who was running for president several times? Yeah. Why, why are we blanking on his name? <laughs> yeah. But you know who I'm talking about. Isn't he yeah. kind of a hero too? Yeah, but he's like, I think, I think not so much because he was like the opposition party in, um, in Russia that was sort of um, allowed to exist. Is that? Uh, okay. But it wasn't that that large got it and like Kasparov is really uh, because if you are like the hero of a communist state or uh then they really build you up right mm -hmm. okay because the, you're the pride of the country They're, yeah like with Sarchi or something it was like the olympic games in russia yeah and uh, or and it's the same thing in china it becomes super important yes. yeah so uh that yeah that and happened to my friend uh anastasia lin she yeah. was Miss Canada and she's Chinese. And so China really built oh. her up in the state media. Yeah. But then she started speaking out <laughs> against organ harvesting. And oh my gosh, like now she's persona non grata over there. Like she can't enter the country. They, she okay. wouldn't, wasn't allowed to enter Hong Kong for a pageant. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And um, organ harvesting that has to do with like there's a minority um, uh, group in China that's mm -hmm. some. I'm not sure if this is like proven, but there are definitely people who accuse China of really um, imprisoning them and repressing them and even yeah. organ harvesting. So I don't talk about the organ harvesting because it's just too gruesome. But yeah. I, mean, I don't think we need to talk about it because China does a lot of things that are atrocious enough without mm -hmm. going that far. But yeah, that's definitely something that's kind of known about. Um, it's very hard to document, but you know, there are more than a million Uyghurs in concentration camps and a lot of them died yeah, the in there. Yeah, Uyghurs. Yeah. Yeah. So, I yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, it's too gruesome. I can't, I can't talk about it, but follow Anastasia Lin mm -hmm. um, if you want to know about that stuff. <laughs> okay. Because, uh, yeah. And there is definitely uh, voices online that talk about this. And for me, because I'm not a specialist in this area, it's sometimes a little bit hard to distinguish between, um, uh, there's also movements like against China that, that uh, generally want to harm it. And sometimes I get a little bit confused, like who's who, like, yeah. like there are multiple uh, parties with agendas. So, so yeah, that's hard for me, but uh, um, it, yeah, yeah really. no, I think that's another obstacle is that it is confusing. Um, and so it's hard for us to keep track of. Even I, it's hard for me to keep track of. And I'm, you know, very familiar with the culture. And so I think the one thing that we need to keep in mind is there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of stirring up of people's emotions for political gain. Mm -hmm. um, and even though there's a lot of that, if a country has the systems and processes in place to reflect the will of the people, eventually will come to the right solution. So, you know, I think, thankfully, we can see that here in the United States right now, is that we have so many problems and the United States has so many sins of the past that are unredressed and still we deal with today. And a lot of those were um, amplified by this last administration and the misinformation was everywhere. And China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, all of these unfree markets were, you know, flooding the U.S. with misinformation just to tear us apart. Um, yet, in the end, the people spoke, and we still came to, I think, a, a solution for a better future, hopefully. So I think if you, if you have something that you believe in, you stand up for that cause, um, all these things will, will fall in place. And I think the, the misinformation, the, the purpose there is to get us to not do anything because we're afraid to do the wrong thing. But I think deep down, most of us know the right thing, regardless of the information out there. Cool, that's, uh, I mean, yeah, that's, thank you. That's great uh, uh, positive uh, message. And maybe if I can ask you like two last questions and then I'll let you go because I've been keeping you way too long. Um, uh, to end this on a positive note, because I can uh, talk to you for hours about these countries and things that um, we hope improve. 
Um, what are what is like the long term trend that you see in freedom? If, if maybe in the last few years, I think maybe it declined a little bit in a global basis. But what what trends are you seeing in like thirty or fifty years? I, I know. In thirty or fifty years, um, so long term, like thirty or fifty years, uh, I do see a, a rise in freedom. Um, the history historically, um, the tide has been pro freedom, but in the short term, it's been declining. So maybe as value investors, we should look at the countries that have the systems and processes in place to correct wrongs, but may have struggled recently with freedom declines. And I think those may be poised for, or could be positioned for a comeback in, in freedom levels um, because they have the systems in place to do that. Uh, and then the ones that are declining but don't have systems in place, those are the places to stay out of. Right. Well, I think for value investors, um, emerging markets and uh, definitely your ETF is super interesting because you think your ETF trades at like the average company is like 13 times uh, price to earnings. Um, yeah. That's not what you find in the U.S. these days. And right. it's a pretty <laughs> uh, tech-loaded ETF. And, um yes. Yeah, that, that's not the case with uh, most other emerging countries. Maybe they score a little bit lower on the PE scale, but then you have a little bit less uh, quality. Um, so where can people find more about you and um, your company and um, uh, re research what's in your uh, yeah, ETF? Or yeah, I mean, since you already mentioned the ticker in the beginning, I'll go ahead and do it here. The ticker sure. of the ETF is FRDM, short for freedom. Um, you can see it behind me there. And um, the, the, the website is freedometfs.com. The index mm -hmm. site is lifeandlibertyindexes.com. Um, and I am on Twitter at Perth underscore toll and on LinkedIn as well. Cool. And I'll put all that in show notes. Um, and uh, it's a pretty cool statue. Uh, that you, so it's a pretty cool oh, statue. That it's, one? Yeah. The, that's the uh, that's one of the posters from our launch event at SIBO. Oh. <laughs> so okay. I don't know if you can see, but it's yeah, it's um, quite cool. large. But, but yeah, I like to have that's actually a new backdrop I just put in there. I'm glad you like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Perf, thank you so much for uh, coming on and uh, explaining everything about your ETF and those countries. Um, best of luck to you and uh, people check it out. Thank you so much and uh, bye-bye. Thank you for having me.